Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is for FERC Order 2222, how it will level the playing field for distributed energy storage and other DERs. This webinar is being presented by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. Before I pass it over to our speakers for today, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in via telephone or you can connect using your computer's mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also click on that to expand your webinar console. And one of the things that you might like to do with your webinar console is to submit your questions and your comments. We encourage you to do that. Please type your questions and your comments in as you think of them. Don't wait until the very end. We're aiming to save about 15 to 20 minutes for a Q&A with our panelists um, at the end of their presentation. And we'll get to as many questions as we can. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send you an email probably this afternoon with a link to the webinar recording and also a PDF of the slides. And we'll also be posting all of that material on CESA's website at cesa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I'd like to now pass it over to our moderator for today's webinar, Todd Alinsky-Paul. Todd is a senior project director here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he will get us started today. Todd, over to you. Thanks, Samantha, and welcome everybody to the webinar. This is Todd Olinsky paul uh, Senior Project Director at CESA. Uh, I will do a very brief introduction of our programs and speakers, and then we will go right into the webinar presentation. Um, I would ask everybody to please type your questions in uh, as you think of them into the console on your screen. Um, after the presentation, I will ask as many questions as we can get to. Uh, we do have a lot of people registered for this webinar, so I expect a lot of questions. Don't wait until the very end. If you have a question during the presentation, just go ahead and type it in, and that way I can um, sort through them and be ready to ask some uh, when the presentation is over. So, uh, Clean Energy States Alliance is a small nonprofit. We are located in Vermont. We uh, are essentially a membership uh, organization for state clean energy agencies. Many of uh, them you can see there on the screen represented by their logos. Uh, we help them with all kinds of clean energy policy and program development and uh, including work on energy storage, which is the main topic of this SDAP webinar series. Uh, if you could advance the slide for me, please, Samantha. The uh, STEP program, um, which is the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, is a program that we conduct under contract to Sandia National Laboratories. It's funded by DOE Office of Electricity. Um, we work with DOE and Sandia and other partners, including utilities, municipalities, state energy agencies, uh, and others around the country to support deployment of energy storage demonstration projects and also to support states in developing energy storage related policy and uh, regulations. And we also disseminate information on energy storage to stakeholders, which is what we are up to today. Next slide, please. So before we go on with introductions of our speakers, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Emery Zhuk, Director of the Energy Storage Research Program at USDOE Office of Electricity, and to Dan Borneo, the Engineering Project and Program Lead at Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, these Folks support this program and much of our other energy storage work. Next slide, please. So uh, we are very fortunate to have two excellent speakers today from Customized Energy Solutions here to give us all an update on FERC Order 2222 and its uh, implementation and potential impact on energy distributed energy storage markets across the country. 
Uh, we will hear from Mike Berlinski, Director for Emerging Technologies at CES. Mike joined CES in 2014 in the Emerging Technologies Group. Uh, he helps clients understand and capture market opportunities in the United States. Previously, he was Manager of Regulatory Affairs at a leading energy storage developer and was very active in promoting rules to enhance market opportunities for storage resources. He also helped bring new energy storage projects online and assisted with their operational and financial management. Prior to that, he held various energy consulting positions in the private and public sectors. He holds a master's in technology and policy from MIT and a bachelor's degree in physics from Wesleyan University. We're also going to be hearing from Ed Topi, Vice President for Distributed Market Integration at CES. Ed joined CES in 2006. His focus is on integration of distributed energy resources, energy storage, retail electricity supply and demand response. He works with clients and stakeholders across all business lines to help them understand economics, market potential, and operation of the various applications. Uh, specifically, he's worked on California's demand response auction mechanism and proxy demand resource participation, Massachusetts state of charge report, ISO demand response programs, behind the meter resource participation models, electric vehicle, grid integration, microgrid analysis, and net energy metering. Prior to joining CES, he was Vice President with Constellation New Energy. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from the United Nations Naval Academy and a Master's of Business Administration from Drexel University. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that is all for the introductions. Um, I see that we still have people signing on. We have almost 300 people on uh, the webinar and we have more people coming on still. So as I said, please type your questions in as they occur to you and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Mike and Ed. Great, thank you, Todd. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Uh, thanks everyone at Clean Energy States Alliance for having us again. So we're here to talk about uh, FERC order 2222, uh, 22, 22, two x four quad deuce. Uh, I've heard lots of different ways to say it. Uh, it has been called landmark, and I would say we'll see about that. Uh, definitely Voltron. Uh, and that's actually from a FERC podcast in which Commissioner Chatterjee likened the order to the cartoon superhero Voltron uh, shown there, uh, which was an aggregation of distributed resources. So I also grew up with that uh, cartoon, so I got a kick out of that. So uh, moving on to the uh, agenda, uh, I'll give a little background on uh, FERC, ISOs, RTOs, distributed energy resources, uh, the order, we'll talk about what it says and what it doesn't say. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ed, to talk about uh, examples of DERs, their economics, uh, some existing barriers, and what the order means in terms of new opportunities, uh, as well as new challenges and things to watch out for uh, as uh, the, the process progresses. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish up with the uh, outlook for implementation. So a little bit about our company, Customized Energy Solutions. Uh, we're a consulting and services firm uh, that helps clients uh, understand and participate uh, at the wholesale and retail electricity and natural gas markets. Uh, we have our headquarters in Philadelphia. We have offices all over the world, and so really global uh, coverage. So this slide shows some of our business lines, and I'll just quickly go left to right, just so you see uh, where we're coming from and uh, uh, how we uh, have been following this issue and how we uh, plan to proceed uh, helping our clients uh, in this area. So first, wholesale, uh, we have a 24-7 uh, network operations desk at our headquarters, and we provide uh, scheduling dispatch services uh, to uh, a number of different clients uh, owning uh, generation, uh, fossil, renewable, uh, demand, load, energy storage into all of the uh, ISO, RTO markets uh, in the US and Canada. Under retail services, we provide uh, back office uh, billing support uh, in, the, in the form of uh, EDI billing, pricing, forecasting, settlements, uh, as well as in the renewable energy management area uh, for RPS uh, and REC uh, registration and optimization. 
Uh, under Future Grid uh, is where Ed and I uh, fall. Uh, Ed is the head of the Distributed Market Integration Group, uh, helping folks understand uh, market rules, uh, optimization, and operations uh, for distributed resources uh, and demand response. Uh, and our uh, Grid Boost offering helps with the optimization uh, of those resources in the markets. Uh, I'm in the Emerging Technologies Group, uh, where we've focused a lot on uh, energy storage and stationary electric storage, but other technologies as well. Uh, and we help clients uh, track policies, uh, do revenue modeling for assets, uh, help uh, investors uh, and sellers with due diligence. And we offer a storage IQ product to help people stay on top of these market developments. And then lastly on the right is Market Intelligence Group, uh, which has folks sitting in every single ISO stakeholder meeting and monitoring that discussion and really help folks stay on top of those market developments and really understand uh, all the existing and potential uh, regu regulatory change in the markets that they participate in. So uh, the company, in addition to uh, managing over 11,000 megawatts uh, of resources in these ISO markets, we also uh, manage and schedule over 300 megawatts uh, of battery and flywheel storage. So we have a lot of operational experience. And then we also have our fingers on the pulse uh, of the market rules uh, development. And, and with that, we've advised energy uh, trade associations on wholesale market policy uh, and supported client comments to FERC on what became order uh, 841 and uh, 2222. So now a little background about uh, FERC and wholesale electricity markets. So uh, that's the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, independent agency uh, that helps regulate uh, transmission wholesale sales of electricity. They regulate the independent system operators and regional transmission organizations, ISOs and RTOs. Uh, you can see in the map there, they cover most of the US. Uh, there's seven total, uh, six are under FERC jurisdiction. Uh, ERCOT in Texas is not. Uh, they do uh, grid operation, power system planning, uh, and market administration. And so those markets that we're talking about are in the list on the left there. Uh, we're talking about capacity or otherwise known as resource adequacy, energy, and ancillary services. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different types of ancillary services. So that's really the markets that this order is talking about, letting uh, DERs have access to these markets and these market products. So again, we're talking about uh, electricity at the wholesale, not the retail level. So we're not talking about state RPS or feed-in tariffs uh, or net metering rules. We're talking about these uh, ISO RTO markets. And, and I would say that they're basically the same thing in ISO and RTO. So I, I sort of will, will use them interchangeably or just use ISO for, for short. So here, what are DERs in general? Um, so generally, small-scale resources can be aggregated, aggregated to provide power and other services, generally going to be connected to the distribution uh, grid at distribution level voltage, lower voltages uh, than the transmission level, uh, and could also be behind a customer meter, uh, generally on, on the smaller scale as it relates to power plants. Uh, and the technologies can be varied. Uh, some examples, certainly not all of them, uh, photovoltaics, uh, solar, other renewable, uh, energy storage, electric vehicles, uh, even fossil fuel generators, as well as uh, energy efficiency and more traditional uh, load control technologies. So now getting on to the order, so some background. I'm not going to go through the whole history, but it's important to know that it started a number of years ago, uh, focusing on energy storage, was expanded to include DERs as well, and then those issues were separated. And uh, there was order 841 on electric storage, a separate docket on DERs. And now in September of this year, FERC issued this order focusing on DERs. It directs the ISOs to remove barriers to the participation of DER aggregations in ISO markets. So uh, helpfully, the order defines uh, DERs, uh, a resource located on the distribution system, including behind a customer meter. Uh, an aggregator, uh, one who will aggregate these DERs, and ISO markets. And again, I listed them on the previous page. The order identifies a number of existing barriers that need to be fixed. For example, a uh, high minimum size, so a really high threshold to aggregate resources to participate in the market. For example, uh, if, if one megawatt is the minimum 
and you have a lot of 10 kilowatt resources, it's gonna be really hard to aggregate that many to get to that uh, minimum capacity size. Also, existing participation models, for example, the ones for demand response uh, are not sufficient. They limit some of the operations, some of the services, and some of the value to all the, the DERs out there. Uh, it did identify a number of benefits, uh, like helping ISOs with visibility, uh, alleviate congestion on the grid, lower energy costs for consumers, uh, and enhance reliability. And I would say that some of the benefits to market participants uh, include greater clarity and specificity around market rules, and it should open new opportunities. And the, the order focuses that the ISOs should establish participation models for DER aggregations that accommodate physical and operational characteristics. Now, this is all very similar to order 841, which did the same, focused on electric storage resources. Uh, and if you want a refresher on order 841, you can review the webinar we did uh, with CISA uh, back in April of 2018. So now compliance filings by the ISOs to FERC are gonna be due uh, in July, 2021. Uh, the ISOs most have started to discuss stakeholder uh, plans with stakeholders. Uh, in fact, ISO New England uh, had their first stakeholder meeting just a few days ago. Uh, I would expect all to be underway by the first quarter of next year. Uh, and I certainly encourage interested parties to participate uh, in the ISO stakeholder processes uh, and then comment at FERC uh, to ensure appropriate market designs. Uh, and then uh, th there will be implementation. Now, FERC left the ISOs to propose a reasonable date, so there's no firm deadline. Uh, looking at the process for Order 841, it's going to be uh, from what, between one and a half to four years from the date of that order for full implementation across all six ISOs. So it could be a long time and it could be quite a range uh, for an order like this. So now a little bit about what the order says. There's uh, basically 10 sections of the uh, order and here's what uh, I've put here. Uh, the ISOs have to change their tariff or have a tariff that does the following. So I'm just gonna go through these quickly, pointing out uh, the important 10 pieces. So the ISOs have to uh, have a tariff that says, uh, DER aggregations are allowed to participate directly and uh, establish DER uh, aggregators uh, as a type of market participant. So you have the uh, aggregators and the aggregations. Allow the aggregations uh, to participate under a participation model that accommodates the physical and operational characteristics. Uh, again, establish a minimum size that's not too high and, and FERC put it at 100 kilowatts. Address locational requirements. So can the uh, aggregation uh, be uh, just at one node or within one zone or across the whole region? Uh, address distribution factors and bidding parameters uh, for the aggregations, uh, acknowledging that these are gonna be collections of resources maybe of different types and, and maybe in different areas. Address information and, and data requirements, metering and telemetry requirements. Uh, importantly, coordination between the ISO, the aggregator, the utility, and the regulator, the state regulator. And address what are the rules for modifications to that list of resources. So if you have, a, if you have an aggregation of 100 resources, 100 assets in there, what happens if, if you change one? One, one is added or, or dropped out. Um, we need rules around that. And then finally, market participation agreements uh, for these aggregators. So here are some other interesting things I wanted to highlight from what the order says. So FERC said uh, very clearly up front, we have the jurisdiction to do this. And that was significant because jurisdiction uh, between federal and state interests, I'd say was the most contentious issue uh, in this uh, earlier uh, proceeding as well as with order uh, 841. So um, in for 841 and 841A, there was a uh, appeals uh, to the appeals court um, and uh, the appeals court did uphold FERC jurisdiction on distributed storage resources. And, and so that is important um, uh, history, uh, but again, uh, that issue uh, really has been raised a number of times in this. Um, similarly, there was a lot of discussion around an opt-out. 
and FERC uh, did not include a state opt-out in uh, 2222. Um, and that's actually now the subject of a complaint at FERC uh, by a demand resource provider. Uh, for opt-in, FERC did uh, allow uh, an opt-in mechanism for small utilities. Uh, that's to avoid overburdening them. So the ISOs can't accept bids uh, from DERs in these small systems unless the, the relevant uh, authority has opted in. And that, that's similar to the rules for uh, demand response. Now, uh, for this order, uh, there were some requests for clarification and rehearing. They, they focused on jurisdiction, uh, the opt-outs, and opt-ins. And, and FERC did issue a notice on this. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand it, FERC waited the 30-day period, so these requests are effectively denied. But FERC did say that it may act on the subject of the requests in the future. So again, if there's any lawyers out there, I would really welcome clarification uh, on this issue uh, of the FERC notice uh, on the requests uh, for rehearing. So back to other interesting things that the order uh, says. It says, um, look, a demand uh, response resource can be a DER, but this order is about DERs. This order does not affect uh, existing DR rules. So the order was clear on these points, but I do anticipate uh, some more clarification and work needed just to see, well, what happens if you have a DR resource part of a DER uh, does it have to make some hard choices or does it really have more options? Um, FERC did say that an aggregation can contain a single resource um, and it says you must allow heterogeneous aggregations. So aggregations of, of different technologies, uh, for example, like solar and storage. So now here's a few things of what the order doesn't say. Uh, the order was not overly prescriptive for ISOs. There was a lot of flexibility left to them. And, and this is significant given that there were a lot of concerns expressed by the ISOs, uh, a lot of pushback uh, during the proceeding. So it'll be very interesting to see um, what the ISOs uh, offer for compliance. Next on interconnection. So FERC declined to, to exercise jurisdiction uh, over the interconnection uh, of DERs uh, as part of an aggregation and says uh, they're not gonna require standard interconnection uh, procedure. Um, so interconnection may remain a challenge uh, if there are major delays or costs uh, for resources. Um, and uh, interconnection options, say if you go a federal or a state process, that can affect market access. Uh, FERC also declined to take up any topics that were, it, it said were beyond the scope uh, of the NOPR. Um, and, and I would say that's mainly okay as, as many of those uh, comments uh, were, were generally negative for facilitating DER participation. Uh, FERC also uh, does not require that the existing market uh, products or services requirements have to change to accommodate DER aggregations. Uh, like order 841 uh, here in 2222, FERC said uh, these resources have to be technically capable of providing a service in order to go provide that service and be compensated for it. So, so for example, if, if an ISO's rule says you need a certain duration, uh, a certain uh, amount of time that you can uh, dispatch energy in order to provide a service, let, let's say for example, four hours duration to provide capacity, that's the rule, that, that's the technical requirement and FERC uh, did not tell the ISOs they have to go change those requirements. It's saying that these resources uh, have to be technically capable uh, to qualify and provide the service. And then lastly, uh, FERC uh, did not require that these ISO markets have to provide enough revenue to make project economics work. Um, and that's really tough. You know, each project is different uh, and it's, it's really about value stacking. Um, it's, it, it, it could be likely that in addition to uh, ISO markets, uh, other value streams are gonna be needed uh, to make project economics work. So, so on that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ed, uh, to talk about some specific examples, uh, real world issues uh, and DER economics. Great, thanks Mike. And thanks Todd and Samantha. And thank you to the over 320 uh, participants we have online now, so uh, welcome. Uh, so DER news has certainly dotted the headlines of our industry uh, rags for, for some time now. Um, 
And some of the more, uh, I would say, notable ones that we've seen over the last, uh, you know, little bit. First, uh, you can see there, Sunrun, you know, made a big splash in the New England capacity markets about uh, a little over a year ago by uh, entering over 20 megawatts uh, of their behind the meter solar and storage resources into uh, the New England's forward capacity market. Um, some others that you would have seen, uh, some news on Green Mountain Power uh, and Tesla uh, teamed up for a distributed storage storage program a couple years back to provide some grid services. Uh, that uh, program uh, continues actually on a successor to it's, it's moved on uh, with Green Mountain to be a bring your own device type of uh, program now. Uh, one of the large, uh, very notable projects in uh, Con Ed, uh, New York City, with their Brooklyn Queens project, which used uh, a whole portfolio of distributed resources to uh, defer over a billion dollars of uh, distribution uh, investment. Uh, that program has uh, spurred, you know, many successor programs are still uh, doing similar projects uh, in the Con Ed territory along those lines. And in Southern California, uh, on the heels of the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, a few years back shutting down, they uh, tried a preferred resources program where, they, again, they used uh, distrib distributed energy resources to replace uh, some of the capacity that was lost with the, uh, the Song's retirement. Um, more well known, and then what we see, you know, continually is just the, the continued uh, growth and proliferation of rooftop and community solar systems, and then, of course, uh, combined heat and power systems for larger customers have been, um, you know, an option as well. Uh, you know, one thing though, as we look at these, that um, is a common theme, and it, it save the sun run uh, news, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about. But in in most cases here, these projects are all uh, focused on one particular revenue stream, and in many cases, they're not uh, market driven. Um, okay. So, however, you know, it's not always possible for DER projects to, uh, you know, to, to pencil out um, or be, I'll say, easy or they'll, they'll face some challenges in trying to, um, you know, to get uh, implemented. Um, a couple of examples that I've got were CES, where we as the, the market participation enabler have some, some direct experience. Uh, we worked with the Pennsylvania hospital system. Uh, where they had a combined heat and power uh, system that they installed uh, and overbuilt it um, to in anticipation of growth of their system. And what they wanted to do was use the excess capacity before their their load needs grew to sell into the uh, PGM capacity market. Well, yes, they were able to do that. Uh, however, it, it did require them to bifurcate the resources into a BTM resource and you know, essentially a wholesale generator and follow the ISO interconnection process in order to, to be a capacity resource at uh, obvious, you know, uh, ostensibly, you know, increased cost uh, and time and, and complexity in the, uh, you know, the implementation process. Uh, we had another uh, project with uh, an aggregator of BTM storage that is back in the halcyon days of the PGM frequency regulation market. Uh, where they had aggregated a number of behind the meter uh, storage resources in anticipation of providing uh, regulation uh, with these resources only, you know, then to find out that the, the project could, um, you know, had to be terminated or, or not uh, proceed because of the export limitation uh, made those projects no longer feasible. And that actually spurred a, uh, uh, sub uh, working group within the PJM stakeholder process to try to address some of the, the challenges of DER uh, participation. Um, and although they made some progress, there's still uh, challenges there. Um, more generally, uh, Wood McKenzie just recently uh, conducted a bit of a where they at now study of uh, non wires alternative projects, which by and large are DER projects uh, over the last few years across a number of states and found uh, some pretty distressing results that nearly 60% of all NWA projects that had been identified uh, as possible and, and uh, you know, I'll say technically feasible across a number of utilities in, in different states uh, have not been pursued. Um, and the most widely cited reason for those is just the, uh, 
you know, the lack of um, cost effectiveness relative to the, um, you know, the more traditional distribution build out. And then also more uh, recently, uh, a study commissioned by NRG and Smart Energy Decisions revealed that the number one pain point across uh, large uh, energy consumers, commercial, industrial, uh, institutional, and governmental type energy consumers uh, for implementing DER uh, is the economics, right? The projects just don't pencil. Um, and then amongst, uh, amongst the top three pain points that they mentioned uh, was also just the uh, unfavorable policy. So uh, both of those reasons, you know, should be, uh, you know, helped along by uh, 2222. So why then is there such an interest in, in distributed energy resources and why the need or even the existence of Order 2222? Well, the compelling reason is that distributed resources uh, provide or at least should be able to provide value across a much broader range of the spectrum than traditional central plant type of structures in the market. Um, in addition to the primary products of energy capacity and ancillary services, uh, DERs generally are more environmentally friendly, uh, either zero or low carbon emitting type of resources. Uh, they are by definition uh, located closer to the point of consumption, so they should help reduce system losses and alleviate congestion on the system. Uh, when they're paired uh, more closely with consumption, whether it be behind the meter or, or locally uh, in front of the meter, they can help provide mitigation of price and potentially outage risk uh, for a customer or a large number of customers. And when considered locationally, they can serve in lieu of traditional distribution infrastructure and fulfill key planning needs. So the issue is that while the DER you know, can theoretically provide this diverse array of value, the current rules and or the market structures don't always allow for the ability of the DER to tap into those value streams. Uh, to date, most deployment has been driven by tapping into one or maybe a few value streams, policy incentives, or regulatory mandates. Uh, most notably, rooftop and community solar are largely supported by net energy metering policies or other renewable incentives such as Massachusetts Smart Program, uh, the California SGIP, uh, the Self Generation Center Program. Uh, non wires alternative projects uh, that, are, that do get pursued are often in areas with such great distribution needs that the need, that, that the deferral value alone can support them from a cost effectiveness uh, basis. Um, DR deployment, then supported by policy incentives, cannot be a long term solution to broader adoption. Uh, the broader adoption needs to be supported by a more market based approach. In order 2222 should, or at least is intended to, create that structure and allow for recognition of greater value through the concept of value stacking, which Mike alluded to earlier. So those familiar with New York and their value of distributed energy resource or meter approach as a successor to their net energy metering are likely familiar with the phrase value stacking as it's become almost synonymous with New York's approach. So what is value stacking? It's just that, right? Assessing or addressing the potentially all available revenue streams, streams and attempting to stack them uh, to achieve greater value for the resource. Uh, some of the value streams simply are not available because the DR, DER would not be technically capable to provide them, which, you know, that's part of the order, right? It, they need to be able to uh, provide any uh, services that they're technically capable to provide. But others, that are, are not available simply by rule policy or market structure, right? So order 2222 is intended to eliminate that by rule on availability and create market structures that at least make them accessible to the resource or the agri, you know, the, the provider of, of the resource in the market, right? Again, as Mike mentioned earlier, what the rule doesn't say is that it has to be economically uh, valuable but it has to be accessible, right? And then the value uh, can be driven by the market and uh, the cost of the technology itself. So what are the ex some of the existing barriers that we hope to address here, right? A lot of them were, were delineated uh, in the order themselves, right? Mike alluded to the high minimum size to participate or even not necessarily the high minimum size of participation in, in some cases, but just the, uh, the inconsistency uh, within a market. Um, some regions have a construct that allow 
uh, aggregations of DERs to participate in certain products and services, but the, the, those products and services in which they can participate uh, have different size requirements. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the existing models uh, through which a lot of DERs uh, are able to participate now are not always sufficient. Um, sometimes they're limited in operations. Uh, again, the, the lack of ability to inject is is a big one in many cases, um, and just the services that they can provide is limited. Um, the visibility, right, of uh, by the ISO of the DERs that in the initial technical discussions following the NOPER uh, that delayed a lot, you know, uh, 2222, that was a lot of the discussion is how do we get the, the visibility and coordination uh, at the ISO level to the, D the distribution system operator uh, and the D DERs themselves. Uh, the clarity and specificity of rules isn't always that great. Uh, technical requirements can be onerous. Um, uh, you, you know, if they're overly burdensome, that usually requires, you know, it leads to higher costs of implementation and often will uh, create, uh, you know, the inability to to clear any uh, financial hurdles for the project. Uh, I mentioned, you know, basically sometimes you just say you can't do this um, by rule um, and we're trying to eliminate those things. Uh, and inability to aggregate in front of the meter resources a lot of uh, regions and, and participation models allow for aggregation from behind the meter but not in front of the meter uh, 2222 should help to uh, alleviate that um, and then allow for um, hybrid and heterogeneous resources as well that being said right there, there have been um, uh, you know market participants that have found creative solutions to full or fuller at least participation uh, in multiple value streams for different types of DER. I mentioned earlier Sunrun has had a, a number of uh, successes in that area, uh, in addition to the New England forward capacity market. Um, you know, they've participated um, in, in California and New York and Hawaii. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, on two, two separate regions, both East Coast and West Coast, where uh, Electric vehicle charging uh, organizations are able to participate uh, as de demand response in various resources, either selling energy by uh, adjusting uh, using smart charging equipment or through uh, participating regulation uh, by modulating the charging uh, the charging at the different resources. So it can be done. Uh, this, but a lot of times we're fitting, you know, the proverbial. Uh, you know, square peg into a round hole to try to make these things work. <clears throat> so what should 2222 then help, right? It, um, as we break down the, the barriers and create a more level playing field, it should, uh, you know, make economic hurdles, I won't say easier, but maybe even at least less difficult to clear uh, due to the availability of more effective value stack um, and lead to greater deployment. Um, you know, then you'll get greater utilization of uh, the, the DERs that do get deployed. Um, and then the value recognition across a broader range should allow for new uh, and creative business models that can move beyond uh, the more straightforward, uh, you know, asset owner or financing models to uh, use the multiple revenue streams and provide energy uh, and DER as more of a service type subscription model. Uh, and then lastly, the ability to aggregate heterogeneous resources or uh, resource types and technologies across meter boundaries, both front of and behind the meter that the, the order calls for um, in the same aggregation should really help advance the concept of the virtual power plant. And so what is the virtual power plant is, uh, again, this is something that's had a lot of uh, attention, been quite a hot topic at Grid Edge for a while now. Um, and what a virtual power plant is, is, is what is contemplated by the order, right? Taking multiple resource types, technologies across different meter boundaries and been able to aggregate those uh, in a network uh, and operate all those resources as a single resource on the electric grid. Um, 
and like the DER space uh, in general, VPPs have um, dotted the headlines of the Grid Edge news in, in recent memory as well. Um, again, I mentioned Sunrun, um, you know, beyond their New England uh, forward capacity market, they've, you know, entered into agreements in Southern Cal Edison, in Orange and Rockland in New York, and Hawaii uh, to use their uh, the solar and storage systems to provide capacity and other grid services. Uh, Portland General uh, in in Oregon um, has announced a four megawatt virtual power plant using an aggregation of over 500 uh, home energy storage systems uh, to provide grid services and capacity in their territory. And then probably most significantly and very recently, uh, a DR provider, OhmConnect, uh, who's a large DR provider in California, and Sidewalk Partners. Uh, announced a plan to create what is being billed as the world's largest residential virtual power plant. They're anticipating a, a 550 megawatt aggregation of residential demand response in California using a combination of load flexibility, energy storage, and smart devices. Um, and notable in this announcement is that it's largely independent of utility contracts to, to pay uh, for the, the services. Um, so they're clearly banking on monetizing this resi station, as they're referring to it, uh, via the available market revenue, and perhaps even anticipating order 2222 to create market structures more conducive to monetizing it. In California, the existing proxy demand, proxy demand resource DR participation model will support it. There are limitations to that model, particularly the provision of certain ancillary services and the ability to export from behind the meter. Uh, and absent or beyond the scope of the uh, demand response auction mechanism, which is a uh, uh, puts demand response in the resource adequacy market in California, accessing that RA market is difficult uh, in California. So it remains to be seen if 2222 will provide a participation model that enables more value recognition or in California or elsewhere, but the intent and the promise is certainly there. So what things do we need to uh, look out for as we watch, the, as the process unfolds to uh, comply with Order 2222? As Mike had mentioned, right, there's a lot of flexibility left to the ISO. So um, as stakeholders, uh, engaged stakeholders, we need to ensure, uh, you know, and to try to at least enforce some uh, consistency uh, across ISOs. Uh, the coordination, again, between ISOs, utilities, and regulators uh, will be a challenge. Um, jurisdiction uh, is going to be something to be watched closely um, and then striking the right balance between the given the utilities to say uh, and avoiding un, undue barriers um, that was a lot of uh, again the pushback in the technical conferences immediately following the NOPER uh, had a lot to do with uh, you know basically the coordination at the distribution level and the visibility um, and you can see some of the other things there dual participation uh, is is a big one, right? How do we treat uh, energy, particularly in the case of uh, storage, uh, where it's if you're going to then export from behind the meter, if the behind the meter storage that wants to participate as a DER and you want to export, um, how do you treat the the charging energy? Um, how do you separate services from the retail bill management to wholesale sales, things like that? Um, uh, capacity requirements there there is an allowance in the order to for having maximum capacity requirements um, are those going to be set to artificially create more barriers um, and then the information and data requirements again uh, are, are big because uh, that can add a lot of cost if they're too onerous with that I'll hand it back to Mike to give us uh, an outlook on the implementation of order 2222 Mike Great, thanks, Ed. So last slide here, just on the implementation outlook. Uh, again, much flexibility left to individual ISO. So as we saw in order 841, uh, it is very likely that there could be significant differences in the market designs uh, across the ISOs. Uh, so if you look in the, the slide uh, in the upper right here, uh, this is from uh, my team's initial assessment of ISO compliance filings on order 841 from a few years ago. So you see the columns are the different ISOs and the rows are all the different pieces of, of 841. And uh, it started out that our thought was some ISOs are in full compliance, some, some had a way to go. So I, I expect a similar process to evolve uh, again from certain stakeholders perspective as to um, uh, you, there could be differences across the ISOs and, and, and 
uh, how fully will they comply? So as I said, ISOs will file compliance uh, proposals that'll include an effective date, stakeholders can file comments, and then at some point FERC will rule. Now, either in parallel or once FERC rules, uh, ISOs will have to work on the non-tariff uh, changes to other documents, manuals, operating procedures, as well as software. And, and I will mention that software changes uh, can take a long time you know, on the order of years. So that could be uh, a limiting factor. Uh, so on timing, uh, as I said, could be uh, one and a half to four years from date of the order for full Im implementation. Uh, and that, that's what we're seeing uh, in order 841. So, so my estimation, estimation uh, maybe implementation at the earliest, beginning of 2022 uh, for ISOs, uh, you know, maybe that have uh, a lot of progress already on DERs, maybe California and, and New York. Uh, so we may see that. So then uh, the slide in the lower right, uh, just from a presentation I gave to the energy storage industry uh, on lessons learned from the 841 process. And, and I'll just want to highlight one point in closing here. Uh, don't build a nice structure on a suboptimal foundation. Uh, same with storage. I I if you create rules for DER aggregations that follow the rules for traditional large power plants, not much will change uh, and the benefits won't be realized. So, so, so I hope, um, uh, you know, again, stakeholders can participate and achieve uh, good rules. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, thank you for your attention and we look forward to the Q&A. Great, thanks for the presentation, guys. Uh, very informative. We have a lot of questions as expected. Uh, we'll see how many we can get to. Um, I do want to ask one thing. Um, there was a distinction made, I believe, between DER which would be distributed energy resources, presumably that would like to participate in wholesale markets, which is what 2222 is supposed to be addressing, and DR, which is demand response, which is distributed resources uh, that um, reduce, typically reduce load, but aren't necessarily in markets. And so the question is batteries, uh, energy storage, can both reduce loads and can export power into markets. So what I'm, I guess since this is a um, uh, energy storage oriented program, um, and I, I'd like to get a little clarity on how batteries fall or are considered if they're behind the meter in the under 2222 is the, now, I'll give you an example. You mentioned Green Mountain Power. They have thousands of batteries behind customer meters that are dispatched uh, at their signal to reduce their demand charges. That would be, I assume, demand response. But they could, presumably, uh, or at least you know, theoretically, decide to uh, instead um, sell that capacity into um, does that then change and and does that then mean that depending on how the utility uses those aggregated resources that they could be either considered DR or, or DER under for 2222 good question yeah. Ed, do you want to take that sure Mike thanks um, so the, I, I think the answer is, is the way that 2222 is worded and structured does not require or even suggest that existing participation models need to be changed, scrapped, uh, uh, you know, eliminated in favor of a, the DER participation model. So the existing participation models under which demand response participates now, which is, you know, demand response as a, a load reduction, whether it be, you know, just load, pure load reduction, or it's enabled by uh, some behind the meter uh, resource that can offset that load, right, like a battery or some other sort of generator. Uh, they are still able to participate under that participation model. Now, but they will have the option to change participation models in the case of something like a storage resource where maybe the amount of participation it's able to do now is limited by the inability 
under a DR participation model to inject. Uh, if the presumably then the DER participation model would allow for injection from behind the meter, they could switch and comply with whatever the requirements of the part that of the DER participation model are and become a DER. But they could they don't have to. So uh, but there again there's no uh, requirement or even suggestion that you uh, change or eliminate existing models. Right, right. So, so if the aggregator, in this case a utility, decided to take the uh, take the capacity, you know, batteries can both produce load and inject power. If they decided to take that injected power capacity and sell it into a market, that would then fall under 2222 as an aggregated resource. Yes, I believe that would be the case, right? That the the the, the, D, the distributed energy resource aggregation mo participation model would be more supportive of that. Great, thank you. So uh, we have a question about the minimum size uh, requirement of uh, not exceeding 100 kilowatts and what that, that exactly means. I'm assuming that what it means that the ISO can't say, you know, the minimum size is a megawatt or, or half a megawatt, that it can only be as large as 100 kilowatts. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Um, so we have a question about um, distribution system needs versus bulk energy market needs. Um, and the question is, shouldn't DERs first look to address distribution system needs before bidding into outside markets? This would make the DSO the likely aggregator with all DERs bidding into that market on a pro rata basis. If the rate structure is properly designed, bidding into the distribution system should always be more profitable. Any thoughts on that? Maybe I'll start on the first part, Ed, maybe you can comment on the second part, but I'll say the order does not require that. The order certainly requires coordination between uh, the utility, uh, maybe the entity functioning as the DSO and the ISO, acknowledging that there could be uh, positives and negatives uh, in terms of impact from a distributed energy uh, resource can 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 help with uh, local voltage support. Uh, can also cause flicker. Uh, can provide capacity to the uh, ISO, um, but also can can re reduce um, the ISO's visibility uh, on on uh, total load in the region. Um, where where there is more value, maybe that that's where I'll stop and turn it over to Ed to to add. Right. I, thanks, Mike. I, I think the the answer is um, in in the value stack, right? If I don't know that it's a valid assumption to say that the distribution system value is always going to be the greatest, because uh, you could there are cases where you, where Mike said it may, um, you know, the distribution system may not have need yet the uh, um, you know the the bulk system, the the wholesale market may offer value, whether it be through ancillary services or just energy prices, uh, that would, uh, you know, prudency would dictate that that would be the first uh, place to offer the the capacity or the energy from the distributed energy resource. Um, now, if you're locating it in a place where there's little to no distribution system value, of course it's going to make it the the stack is going to be lower. Right, and it's going to be you know more difficult to clear an economic hurdle for the entire you know for the project. So, uh, but I, I don't necessarily see that it it will always be a situation where the distribution value is greater, and therefore those services would be prioritized. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, somebody wants to know what happens where, when there's grid congestion, frequency problems, or voltage problems. Who manages control of the distributed energy resources? Yep, good question. So, so right now, there are resources operating behind customer meters, connected to distribution voltage, and connected to transmission voltage. And there is uh, some coordination or there is some ability to operate the system uh, reliably uh, and, and give um, at least some visibility to, to, to both the DSO and the uh, ISO. But, but I do think that exact point will be the focus of the, the, the issues around coordination going forward, anticipating even more resources uh, of, of uh, different uh, technology makeup, providing different services, uh, doing different dispatch, um, and again, causing more positives and negatives uh, at both the distribution and the transmission level. Ed, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I, like you said, I think it's just a matter of coordination and some sort of uh, prioritization order of the, you know, the needs and then who takes, you know, who has control to dispatch or, or curtail uh, based on the prioritization of the needs and that coordination. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have somebody who wants to know whether you see Order 2222 as having uh, potential to lift or ease the no injection limitations that you mentioned. Yeah, they, I'll, I'll answer. I, I believe uh, that they will. Uh, lift um, or at least a, a leave right and, and provide a mechanism uh, through a participation model that supports or allows for those injections now the the mechanism by which that is allowed to be done right that that remains to be seen right and and, and will it does it necessarily mean that it's going to be a, a pain less uh, in low cost, uh, you know, opportunity to to achieve that that's re rely you know lies in the implementation. But the I think the if I you know if I'm a uh, an implement you know an ISO charged with implementing this, um, you know I think the participation model at least at the the outset would need to include that right, and then you need to figure out what is the, the the model and the requirements in order to allow it not just uh, go in assuming it's not going to be allowed yeah I, I guess another way to ask this might be um, in the situation for example where the utility is not allowing uh, customers who's, who have storage to export power or where the Utility regulator is not allowing power export from behind customer meters. Um, how does that, does 2222 resolve that in some way, or is that really uh, at that level going to have to uh, be something that gets resolved through, you know, either uh, regulatory dockets or, or some other kind of, you know, action at the, at the local level? Well, yeah, when you just, I mean, uh, what that comes down to is the, you know, now you're in the jurisdiction discussion, right? If if it's a, a state item, you know, that for whatever reason they're they're saying it's not allowed, right? Whether it's through the interconnection process or the, you know, the utility regulation, then you know it it becomes by necessity a, a collaborative effort to try to alleviate it, right? Um, I don't believe FERC or the ISOs have any authority um, to force that issue. Mike, I, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, going back to, to, to sort of participation models, I could see uh, DER, the ISO is creating a new DER model that uh, in terms of a resource net injecting from behind the meter, uh, right now you can't do that under the DR model. So maybe ISO creates this DER model where the resource 
could could be the same. It's it's a behind the meter battery. It's it's solar, whatever behind the meter. But now this DER allows net injections, whereas the ISOs can keep their DR model that does not allow net injections from behind the meter. So that that's one way where two 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 can address a, a key barrier that's been raised, um, and um, as I said, not not guaranteed it's going to solve all the problems, but but that is one way that uh, uh, progress could be made to accommodate uh, uh, different resources, different uh, business models. Um, but the issue is still there that, that, that states and retail programs may have their own rules about what counts as net metering, what counts as uh, renewable energy credit worthy. Uh, that is a whole separate set of issues. Yeah, okay. So uh, do you guys have an extra few minutes here? I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, if you can can answer another couple of questions, I, um, I'll try to get a couple more in. Yes. If not, I totally understand. Yeah, I can hang around for a couple more minutes. Great. Uh, so this is kind of a, a question related to the one we just discussed, and maybe take a slightly different um, angle on it. The, the, the person says, Kentucky has a statutory monopoly whereby a designated utility is the sole provider within its region. Does FERC 2222 offer any options for non-utility suppliers? So I guess there's two kind of a couple questions embedded here. One is again, can the uh, individual owning the distributed energy resource somehow access the market without that utility's uh, collaboration uh, through a third party aggregator, for example, or does that utility now have to um, come up with some way to comply and allow the DER owner to access those markets through the utility in some way? Or is that is that not contemplated within the FERC order? Mm, um. Yeah, I kind of think on my feet on this one. I, I first, I, yeah, I don't know if the, the order can specifically um, address that, but I would be, imagine that it is contemplated to allow for that, right? Specifically because they, um, you know, they don't have as mike mentioned right one of the things that they they don't have the opt out provision like they do with demand response uh the demand response orders um so if if it's if it falls into the the domain of a if it's a larger utility the greater than four million uh per year then there's not an opt uh, an ability for the state to opt out. So I would say that it does contemplate allowing third party providers uh, to offer that, you know, to provide the, the access to the wholesale market if it's available. Yep, I'd agree. Great, thanks. I know these are tough. I mean, we, we, we've got a number of these kinds of questions, you know, can the, can the distribution utility override the ISO and you know, and so forth and so on. So the yeah, you know, people are obviously um, in different circumstances, and some utilities are more uh, sort of uh, forward-looking than others in terms of harnessing you know distributed behind the meter resources. And so you can imagine there's a lot of uh, in questions about this. Um, right. And and just a, a comment on that. I think the you know where where it comes down to you know the utilities. Currently, or um, you know, if it's if it's, I think at least what the this order should do is create the mindset of if not, why not, as, as opposed to just saying no, right? Um, I think there's more at least you know pressure whether that there's the ability to um, you know there's the jurisdiction doesn't exist, but at least there's there should be, you know, societal and, and you know, political pressure, if nothing else, to uh, 
had the, the default saying that it's you know that there's it's more um, more liberal in terms of participation, and if if we're going to limit it, there's more onus to say why why you're not allowing it as opposed to the default being it's not allowed, which I think has been more prevalent. Yeah, that's a good point. Just to sort of expand on that, I, I see a demand response in the wholesale markets growing up in a world of traditional front-of-meter generators and having to get some new rules, Order 745, 719, and others from FERC and, and, and other rulings to enable uh, load management to have comparable ability to access those markets. Same with renewable generators, intermittent resources, growing up in a world with dispatchable uh, resources, rules written for them and having to have new rules written to accommodate uh, non-dispatchable uh, resources. Uh, and then electric storage uh, coming onto the scene in a world of, uh, well, you're either generator or load. P pick one of those two and, 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 and electric storage you can 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 uh, in inject uh, and withdraw and had to have rules change. So now we have DERs, uh, smaller resources aggregated, could be front of the meter, could be behind the meter, um, and a lot with the desire to be located behind the meter, but net inject, a lot to be, uh, you know, desire uh, mixing technology, solar and storage at the same site. So so it's it's a similar progress of uh, newer technologies, newer business models, uh, requiring, uh, as Ed said, the rules to be re rewritten because um, you can't do that because our rules don't explicitly say we contemplated your your type of resource is just not good enough. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about um, double dipping. Uh, um, as advanced retail rates are emerging, such as critical peak pricing and uh, on-peak versus off-peak rates, um, with FERC 2222, um, there may be overlap with such advanced pricing and participation in the wholesale market. Um, how are challenges such as double counting and monitoring and verification being addressed? And should participants in advanced retail pricing programs be ineligible for wholesale market participation? Uh, another person asks, um, how might DER participation in different markets be tracked to guard against offering the same capacity in multiple markets? How do aggregators know whether the DER in their portfolios is also part of other aggregators' portfolios? So a lot of interest in this question. How do you is there a need to guard against uh, double gaming, I suppose, these various uh, mar overlapping markets and, and um, incentive programs and so forth? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. It's an issue that's going to need to be addressed. Um, I think a lot can be learned uh, in the development of the DER participation model along those lines that, you know, from what's been done uh, in the DR, the demand response markets, um, things like, uh, you know, there's there's processes in place now to ensure, you know, certain locations in the DR participation model, you know, aren't in multiple uh, curtailment service or demand response providers portfolios. Um, or the utilities portfolio, uh, there are metering, the metering and verification requirements uh, uh, in some locations have been uh, enhanced, you know, and, and uh, you know, to be able to detect uh, certain things that are, you know, referred to as like, uh, um, you know, if they're if it's routine service that's providing like retail bill management, uh, you can't also then offer that as wholesale demand response, right? There, you know, then there's ways that the requirements on the the way that the performance is measured uh, can help identify if that's being done or to ensure that it's not. Um, and you know the offering the you know the different capacity 
for or the same capacity for different services from a from a distributed energy resource. So these these resources are going to have uh, information requirements with uh, you know the dispatching authority, whether it's you know at the ISO or DSO level, um, you know to end bidding uh, structures and and uh, protocol that ensure they you know that they're not offering the same uh, capacity into multiple. Know, for multiple services at the same getting paid for multiple uh services at the same time right so so it is certainly possible and and doable we've got examples of how it's already being done it just needs to be sounds like uh things um, safeguards need to be adopted from programs for uh for these new uh market entries well, look, um, we're at 10 after, and I think that's as far as I'm uh, going to be able to stretch the time on this webinar. So uh, thanks to everybody who um, joined us, and um, apologi uh, my apologies to those whose questions were not addressed. We did, did get to as many as we could. Uh, thanks again to our presenters, Mike Berlinski and Ed Topi um, from Customized Energy Solutions. And um, I will now hand it back to Samantha to uh, mention a couple of upcoming webinars before we sign off. Thanks, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Um, so before everyone signs off for the day, I just want to let you know about a couple of webinars that we have coming up. You can read details about that on our screen, um, and you can also read more and sign up at cisa.org backslash webinars. All of these webinars are free and open to the public, and we hope to see you there. Thanks, everybody.